Mr. President, I ask unanimous consent that I be permitted to enter in a colloquy with the Senator from uh, Delaware. Without objection. Uh, Mr. President, I'm here today to uh, discuss, uh, along with the Senator, uh, the issue of Russia. I know it's been at the forefront of much of the debate that's ongoing in this country. And, uh, about, and I wanted to begin by commending the Vice President and the Secretary of Defense and the Secretary of Homeland Security and the Secretary of State for their strong message of support for NATO. And that includes the President last night. Uh, and their strong support, by the way, for the transatlantic alliance uh, that these individuals outlined during their respective visits to the Munich Security Conference and meetings with allies in February. At that Munich Security Conference on the 18th of February, the Russian Foreign Minister, Sergei Lavrov, said, this is a quote, I hope, he means the world, will choose a democratic world order, a post-West one, in which each country is defined by its sovereignty, end quote. And I think that based on recent history, it's clear that when a Russian leader says post-West, we should interpret that as a phrase to mean post-Americans. And so I'd ask the, the, the senator uh, with regards to this, uh, what are his views uh, with regards to Vladimir Putin's uh, desire to establish spheres of influence in Europe and the Middle East, uh, create divisions with our allies. Uh, how should we view the Russian worldview as it compares uh, to the interest, the national interest of the United States? I'd like to thank my friend, uh, the Senator from Florida, uh, my colleague on the Foreign Relations Committee and on the Appropriations Committee. Um, and I'd like to answer uh, his question by saying it seems clear to all of us on the Foreign Relations Committee who have had the opportunity to travel to Eastern Europe to visit with our NATO allies, uh, that Vladimir Putin uh, has a worldview and an agenda that is in sharp contrast with our own. Vladimir Putin dreams of returning Russia to the days of the Russian Empire, to re-exerting influence over a broad geographic region from the Baltic Sea and Poland and Ukraine to the Caucasus and Central Asia, and he has internally used the West and NATO as a scapegoat for Russia's internal economic woes. He has, as we know, launched invasions or extended his influence through forces um, and supported illiberal and separatist fighters in Georgia and Ukraine and Moldova, former Soviet republics, and has launched cyber attacks and propaganda campaigns and coordinated the use of all of his tools of state power against our NATO allies in the Baltic region and in Central and Western Europe. And all of these things suggest a very different worldview, a different set of values than we have here in the United States and a different set of uh, values in a way that really uh, worries me. Uh, as my colleague from Florida has suggested, when uh, Foreign Minister Lavrov talks about a world order defined by sovereignty, he's challenging us. He's challenging what the West really stands for, what we in America stand for. And I believe what we stand for is the universal values on which we forged a transatlantic alliance more than 70 years ago. A transatlantic alliance that has been a force for stability and good in the world, and a transatlantic alliance that has secured peace in Western Europe, North America, ever since the close of the Second World War. But a transatlantic alliance that is rooted in values, values of freedom of speech, freedom of press, rule of law, and democracy, and in opposition to authoritarianism. We support American leadership because a stable and prosperous world makes us safer and more economically secure. So I'd ask my friend from Florida what he views as the, the agenda or the objective of Russia, and whether or not we can be hopeful in any way um, that Vladimir Putin's Russia has an agenda that is harmonious with ours, that can be um, put in the same direction as ours, or whether it's fundamentally at all. Well, and to answer that question, I would begin by reminding everyone that when we are talking about Russia, we are not talking about the Russian people. We're talking about Vladimir Putin and the cronies that surround him and their goals for the future. We have no quarrel with the Russian people, who I actually believe would very much want to have a better relationship with the United States and certainly live in a world in which their country was more like ours than the way their government now runs theirs. Uh, and I, the second thing I would point to is it's important to understand history. At the end of the Second World War, uh, Nazism had been conquered and, and uh, the Japanese Empire had uh, its designs had also been ended, fascism defeated. And uh, in the U.S. And, and the world entered this period of a, of a, of a Cold War, a battle between the communism and the free world. And the United States and our allies stood for that freedom. At the fall of the Berlin Wall, the end of the Soviet bloc, the fall of communism, the world we all hoped had entered into this new era where every nation had a different system, maybe some had a parliamentary system, maybe some had a republic such as ours, but in the end, more people than ever would have access to a government responsive to their needs. And that was the growing trend around the world up until about seven, eight, ten years ago. 
We now see the opposite. We see a rising arc of totalitarianism. And within that context is where I believe Vladimir Putin's worldview is constructed. Uh, he views the values that we stand for, which some may call Western values, and perhaps that's the right terminology, but I really believe they're universal values. The idea that people should be, have a role to play in choosing their leaders, that people should have the freedom uh, to worship as they see fit, that people should be able to express their opinions and ideas freely without fear of retribution or punishment by their government. Uh, these are the values that I, that I think we have, that we have stood for and that our allies have stood for and that we had hoped Russia would stand for in this new era. But Vladimir Putin viewed that as a threat. And in particular, over the last number of years, he has decided that the best way for him to not just secure his place in Russian politics uh, is, the best way for him to secure his role in Russian politics is through an aggressive foreign policy in which he views as a zero-sum game. That's not the way we view it. We actually view the world as a place where we can help rebuild Japan, we can help rebuild Germany. They're stronger and we're stronger. It isn't one or the other. He does not. He views the world as a place where in order for Russia to be greater, America has to be less. In order for him to be more powerful, we have to be less powerful. And a world in which he has to undermine democratic principles and try to expose them as fraudulent. It's why you saw the Russian intelligence services medal in our elections in 2016. It was one of the main designs they had was to create doubt and instability about our system of government, discredited here at home, but discredited around the world. It's why I just returned from Europe a week ago at this time in both Germany and in France, who have upcoming elections of their own. They are seeing an unprecedented wave of active measures on the part of Russian intelligence to try to influence their elections. It's why it's, as in the Netherlands, we've seen some of the same and so this is very concerning, and our European allies are very concerned about the weaponization of cyber technology to strategically place information in the public domain for purposes of undermining candidates, steering elections, and undermining policymaking. And I want to everybody to understand this is not just about elections. The exact same tools that they used in the 2016 presidential election, they could use to try to influence the debate in the Senate by attacking individual senators or individual viewpoints and, and using uh, their control over propaganda uh, to begin to, to spread that. I'll give you just one example, and, and that's in May of 2015, the German intelligence agencies reported an attack on the German parliament, on energy companies, on universities. They attribute that to Russian hackers. In Montenegro, the prime minister has sought membership in NATO, an action we've supported in the, intelli in the, in the Senate uh, Foreign Relations Committee, which what both of us serve on, and, and Russian intelligence has plotted at a, at a very aggressive level to disrupt their elections late last year. They use TV and, and internet outlets like Russia Today, or what's called RT and Sputnik, to launch propaganda campaigns to out galvanize anti-U extremists in the Dutch elections. The list goes on and on. There's no shortage of them. The point is that we are in the midst of the most aggressive active measures ever undertaken by a foreign government to not just meddle in American policy debates and American elections, but in those throughout the free world. And, uh, and, it is, and, it, and it is deeply concerning. I think another matter which I'd love to hear the Senator's opinion on is on the issue of human rights violations. Because on top of being a totalitarian state, what goes hand in hand with totalitarianism is human rights violations. In fact, totalitarianism is in of itself a human rights violation, but there can be no dictatorship, no repressive regime, no totalitarian leader who can maintain themselves in power without violating the human rights of their people. And so I would ask the senator, and, and I would love to have his comment, on whether or not indeed Vladimir Putin is a serial human rights violator and what our policy should be in terms of outlining that to the world. Well, we have uh, worked together on a number of bills in this area, and um, let me respond uh, to my friend the senator by saying that it is clear um, that Vladimir Putin's Russia has been a serial human rights violator. When we talk about human rights, we talk about things that belong to everyone and that are necessary as a check on state power. And when nations break these rules, we believe they should be held accountable. And Russia continues to engage in efforts, as my colleague said, that undermine democracy and free elections throughout Europe. And we have shared concerns about the upcoming elections, uh, the Dutch elections, French, German, uh, German and uh, French elections, uh, where there are overt actions and covert actions by Russia to influence the outcome of those elections. But part of why they're doing that, part of why they're violating these norms around Europe is because they're seeking to distract from their brutal rule at home. The reality is that many of the critics of Putin's regime end up dead or incapacitated. 
Boris Nemtsov, a Russian politician who supported the introduction of capitalism into the Russian economy and frequently criticized Vladimir Putin, was assassinated two years ago on February 27th on a bridge just near the Kremlin in Moscow. Vladimir Karamurza, a Russian politician and journalist, was apparently poisoned last month, the second time in recent years. He had been actively promoting civil society, democracy, and human rights in Russia. And back in September of 2012, Putin threw USAID out of Russia altogether, claiming that U.S. efforts were undermining Russian sovereignty, when in fact we'd been working in Russia since the 90s, supporting human rights, independent journalism, and promoting fair elections. Most importantly, in my view, Russia doesn't just violate the human rights of its own citizens. It exports brutality. And Russia's support for Bashar al-Assad's murderous regime and the brutal war in Syria continues. Their military has targeted hospitals, schools, and Syrian first responders. They've blocked the provision of food and medicine to starving families and children. And Russia's diplomats have vetoed any effort at the United Nations to act to stop the suffering in Syria. Russia also having uh, illegally invaded Ukraine and annexed Crimea, um, continues to promote violence and instability in eastern Ukraine and the Donbas region, leading to the deaths of thousands. All of these human rights violations within Russia and in uh, countries around its sphere of influence in its region um, suggest to us that they need to be held accountable for these violations of basic human rights. Like the senator from Florida, uh, I led a CODEL to Eastern and Central Europe. Mine was not last week, it was last August. Uh, but with two Republican House members and two Democratic Senate members, the five of us went to the Czech Republic, to Ukraine, and to Estonia. And we heard broad spread concern about this record of human rights and a disrespect for democracy in Russia, and about this aggressive hybrid warfare campaign that threatens Ukraine's very stability and existence, that puts Estonia, our NATO ally, on warning, um, and that is putting at risk Czech independence and Czech elections all across Central and Western Europe. I've heard from, we have heard from, uh, ambassadors, experts, those who have testified in front of committees on which we serve about a Russian campaign, a brutal campaign, to undermine human rights within Russia and to undermine democracy throughout Western Europe with a larger strategic goal of separating the United States from our Western allies and of undermining the transatlantic alliance that has been so essential to our peace, security, and stability for 70 years. And we cannot let this stand. There is no moral equivalence between Russia and the United States. And if we believe in our democracy and if we believe in our commitment to human rights, we must stand up to this campaign of aggression. So I asked my colleague what he believes we might be able to do on the Foreign Relations Committee and the Appropriations Committee or here in the Senate and what we might do as voices working in a bipartisan way to stand up to these actions undermining democracy and human rights. Well, and that is the central question. The, the first is what we're doing now. It's an important part about shining, sun, sh uh, shining the sunlight on all of this, making people aware of it. We know, for example, in France, uh, two of the leading candidates uh, have views that I think the Kremlin would be quite pleased with if that became the foreign policy of France. A third, not so much, a uh, very young candidate running as an independent, last name is Macron. And suddenly, as he began to surge in the polls, all these stories start appearing, ridiculous stories about his personal life and, and about his marriage, things that are completely false, completely fabricated. Fortunately, French society and the French press understands this and have reported it as such. Uh, but it's important for us. This is happening. It is real. And, and it is unprecedented at its scope and in its aggression. So shining light on the reality, understanding that this is, I always tell my colleagues, I said this back last, last October, it's not a partisan issue. I'm telling you that to my Republican colleagues who might be uncomfortable about discussing Russian interference, this is not about the outcome of the election. This is about the conduct and what happened throughout it. And what they did in, in last year in the fall in the presidential race, they can do against any member here. If they don't like what you're saying, if they think you're getting too far on policy, you could find yourself the target of Russian propaganda in the hopes of undermining you, perhaps even having you eliminated from uh, the debate uh, because they understand our political process quite well. The second is to do no harm. There's this notion out there, and I think on paper it sounds great, right? Let's, why don't we just partner up with the Russians to defeat ISIS and take on radicalism around the world? The problem is this. Number one, that's what Russia claims they're already doing. Vladimir Putin claims he's already doing that. So if he's already doing it, why would we have to partner with him? He's already doing it. Obviously, the answer is because he hasn't been. This has been about propping up Assad. Here's the other. When you partner up with someone, you have to take responsibility for everything they do and all the actions they undertake. 
And Senator Coons just outlined a moment ago, he said, well, we talked about the bombing in Aleppo. Think about it. If we had been partnered with Russia in Syria and they're bombing Aleppo and they're hitting hospitals and they're killing civilians, those are our partners. We have to answer for that as well. We would be roped into that. And the third is to understand their strategic goal is not to defeat radical elements in the Middle East. Their strategic goal is to have an ordinate influence in Syria with Iran, potentially in other countries, at the expense of the United States. We've had two presidents, a Republican and a Democrat, previous to the current president, who thought they could do such a deal with Vladimir Putin. Both of them fell on their face because they did not understand what they were dealing with. It is my sincerest hope that our current president doesn't make the same mistakes. And, I, and in addition to that, I know there are a number of legislative approaches that we have worked on together as members of both the Senate Foreign Relations Committee and the Senate uh, Foreign Operations Appropriation, Appropriations Subcommittee. And I would ask the Senator from Delaware if you could highlight some of those legislative matters that we've been talking about, resolutions, laws, and public policy that we've been advocating. Well, briefly, if I could, um, two bills that are currently uh, gathering um, co-sponsors, which I hope our colleagues will review and consider uh, joining us in co-sponsoring. Uh, one is S-341, the Russia Sanctions Review Act of 2016, excuse me, 2017, which currently has uh, 18 co-sponsors. Um, the other uh, is S-94, the Counteracting Russian Hostilities Act of 2017. And that has 20 co-sponsors, 10 Republicans, and 10 Democrats. In both cases, uh, we are, I think, proud to have a very broad range of both Republicans and Democrats engaged in important legislation um, that ensures that Russia pays a price for breaking the rules, that starts by taking action uh, to support the sanctions against the Russian government for its occupation, its illegal annexation of Crimea, and for its egregious human rights violations in Syria, and for meddling in the U.S. election. It prevents the lifting of sanctions on Russia until the Russian government ceases the very activities that caused these sanctions to be put in place in the first place. And it supports civil society pro-democracy, anti-corruption activists in Russia and across Europe to show that we, that many of us are determined as members of the Foreign Relations Committee, as members of the Appropriations Committee, as senators, not as partisans, that we intend to fund the tools that will enable the United States and our NATO allies to push back on Russia's aggression. Most of these tools come from the international affairs budget, the State Department, and foreign assistance accounts. And I want to commend you, Senator, uh, for giving a, a strong and a passionate speech on the floor yesterday uh, about the importance of our keeping all of these tools in our toolkit so that as we confront our adversaries around the world, we have the resources and the ability to partner with and strengthen our allies as well. We have no quarrel with the Russian people. But we're here because there's nothing Vladimir Putin's regime would love more than to see his actions divide us in this chamber and divide us in this country from our vital allies in Europe and divide the whole North Atlantic community that for seven decades has brought peace and stability to Europe, has brought prosperity to the United States, not as an act of charity, but as an investment in the best interest of security. We are here to say with one voice that we will stand up to Russian aggression that undermines democracy and violates human rights. I'm grateful for my colleague for the chance to join him on the floor today, and I look forward to working together with any of our colleagues who see these issues as clearly as my friend and colleague, the Senator from Florida. And I, and I thank the Senator for, for joining me in this endeavor here today, and it's important that we speak out about this. In a moment, the Majority Leader will be here with some procedural uh, matters uh, that will, I guess, uh, take the Senate into a different posture. So before that happens, I, I wanted to close by not just thanking him for being a part of it, but making a couple more points. The first is that uh, I want you to imagine for a moment if you're sitting at the Kremlin and you're watching on satellite television the debate going on in American politics today, you're probably feeling pretty good about yourself. You've got one group arguing that maybe the elections weren't legitimate because the Russians interfered. You have another group arguing uh, with the Intelligence Committee. Uh, in essence, you have the, the, there's been news reports about tension between the President and the Intelligence Committee. You have these reports every single day back and forth. And you're looking at all this chaos and you're saying to yourself, we did a pretty good job. If what we wanted to do is divide the American people against each other, have them at each other's throat, arguing about things and sowing chaos and instability into their political process, I think you look at the developments of the last six weeks and six months and you say, to your, if you're in the Kremlin, and you say, well, our efforts were pretty successful at that. And I think that's the first thing we need to understand. The second thing is that this should all be about partisanship. I am a member of the Senate Intelligence Committee. It's publicly known that we are undertaking an investigation into Russian interference in the 2016 elections. I want everyone to know I speak for myself, and I believe, if not all of my colleagues, almost all of my colleagues, to say, on the one hand, I'm not interested in being a part of a witch hunt. On the other hand, I will not be part of a cover-up. 
We are going to get to the truth. We want to get to the truth. We want to be able to deliver to this body and to the American people a document with truth and facts wherever they may lead us. Because this is above political party. Our system of government in this extraordinary republic that's been around for over two centuries is unique and it is special. And with all its blemishes and flaws, I wouldn't trade it for anything in the world. I want people to think about that. The next time you wonder and say to yourself, things are so tough in America, things are going so poorly, well, who would you trade places with? I'm not saying we don't have problems, because we do. But I ask you, what country would you rather be? I promise you, you won't say China, if you, if you know anything about China. I promise you, you won't say Russia, if you know anything about Russia. There isn't a nation on earth you would trade places with. And there is no process of government that I would trade for ours. It is not perfect. And one of the strengths of our system is our ability to stand up here in places like this in the Senate and discuss our differences and our problems and make continuous progress forward, even if sometimes the pace is slower and more frustrating than we wish. And that is what's at stake here in this process. That is what's at stake here in this debate. And that's what none of us can allow to see erode because of interference by a foreign government, especially one whose leader is a thug and a war criminal in every sense of the word. And so, again, our quarrel, as our, my colleague said, is not with the Russian people. It is not with Russia. I have extraordinary admiration for the Russian people. I have extraordinary admiration for the sacrifices and the contributions that they have made throughout history to our culture and to the world. But unfortunately, today, their government is run by an individual who has no respect for his own people and has no respect for the freedom and the liberty of others. And it is important for our policymakers on both sides of the aisle to be clear-eyed and clear-voiced in what we do moving forward. And I thank the Senator for being with us here today and, uh, and allowing us to engage in, in this discussion. I hope we'll see more of that in the weeks and months to come so that we can speak clearly and firmly with one voice, that on issues involving America and our sovereignty and our system of government and the decisions we must make, we will speak with one voice as one nation, as one people, as one country. I thank you, Mr. President. And I yield the floor and suggest the absence of the clerk. Clerk will call the roll.